the title of this public lecture is Fighting Racial Injustice in a Vacuum of Truth. In many ways, it is a foreshadowing of the shape of things to come because thankfully we do not yet exist in a complete vacuum of truth. That is the risk, however, if we do not see the guarding and elevation of truth as central to the mission of racial justice. And if we do not confront the current assault on truth as part and parcel of one of the most egregious forms of racial injustice. I firmly believe that one of the most urgent threats facing the civil rights community and social justice advocates more broadly is the erasure of truth writ large, and especially the denial of the very fact and existence of racism and other forms of identity discrimination. You know, one of the most important tools in confronting and rooting out racial injustice is the ability to apply objective facts to law or apply the law to objective facts. And as lawyers and law students, we know that facts are often in dispute. And, and were they not, many lawyers would have to find a different vocation. But I'm talking about something other than the interpretation of fact. In the current anti-truth climate in which book bans, censorship, curriculum purges, and the denial of history threaten to legislate fact and critical thinking out of public discourse. The fight for racial justice is threatened in unprecedented ways. And lawyers who rely on centering the discomforting and often harsh truths of past and present discrimination face a unique challenge in their advocacy. And I can testify to that. This is no ordinary fight. While the current campaign against truth has clear historical underpinnings and carries echoes of the lost cause, the negationist theory or myth that slavery was not central to the Civil War, today's war on truth is being driven by an alarming and concerted mobilization effort that leverages three critical things. First, a socio-political climate that's marked by division and distraction. Second, technological tools that rapidly amplify disinformation and that create an impression that an extreme and radical anti-truth minority represents the interests of the majority when in fact it does not. And thirdly and relatedly, platforms that enable fringe groups to organize in ways like never before, including plugging into national and international communities online that translates into real world action that can be destructive and highly dangerous. And we see evidence of that on our news feeds daily. The upside though, and, and no doubt the impetus for this very campaign of censorship and lies is that we are at a crossroads in our nation's history. And this was born out of the unprecedented and powerful protests and racial awakening that unfolded last year, where there is now a palpable hunger for truth, for learning, for cross-cultural exchange, for challenge and for transformation that stands as a direct threat to those invested in white supremacy and patriarchy whether they say it expressly or not. These assaults, or what we at LDF call the anti-truth movement, are taking the form of book bans, witch hunts aimed at teachers and school administrators, and importantly, they use as subterfuge the mischaracterization and castigation of critical race theory as a deleterious force of division, as opposed to what it actually is, an insightful method of illuminating and interrogating how the racist origins of this country pervade policy, law, and culture. And you have some of the very best critical race law theorists and professors at UCLA today. These anti-truth assaults are signature markers of a society that is becoming more anti-democratic, increasingly authoritarian, 
And frankly, that is devolving into fascism because the attempted starvation of knowledge is itself a form of indoctrination. Now, it would be a mistake to characterize this phenomenon as the media often does uh, as a culture war. This is not about trend or fleetingly fashionable ideas. We are in a death match to control memory. We are in a battle of narrative power about how we and future generations will see ourselves and our lived experiences and how we understand and make sense of the past, our present, and whether we have a collective future. And so in the time we have together today, I'd like to do four things. First, I want to sound the alarm. And I hope I've done that with this introduction and, and can now check that off the list. Second, I wanna make sure that we leave this conversation with a clear understanding of how the threat I just described is being operationalized. Third, I posit that the narrative tools that we use in racial justice advocacy will be severely compromised if this assault on truth continues unabated and the principles that we rely on as central to our constitutional democracy will be similarly challenged. And finally, I want to leave you with a charge for ways you can get involved in the fight for the elevation of truth and justice in our democracy ways to effectively demand that truth be told. So how is the threat to stifle truth about racial injustice being operationalized? For a little table setting, I wanna share a few slides that summarize the legal landscape. And without going down the rabbit hole of all the historical connections to this present day move movement, I will focus our attention on a specific executive action that in many ways was the starting pistol for the current assault on truth. So some of you may be familiar with this, but one of the final missives of the last president was what is showing in this first slide, an executive order EO 13950, which is misleadingly titled the executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping. It was issued in September, 2020. And thankfully, President Biden issued an executive order almost immediately following his inauguration, revoking this order. But before he did that, this order took aim at federal agencies, US military institutions, grant recipients and contractors by forbidding them from engaging in speech activities, including workplace trainings that promote diversity, equity and inclusion, and it conditioned federal funding on adherence to a prescribed and ahistorical belief system. If you look at the language of the executive order, you will see references to divisive concepts, to race and sex scapegoating and stereotyping. We were deeply alarmed to see just the term divisive concepts and to see that included in that definition were basic rights to talk about race, to talk about diversity and inclusion, and to be truthful to the history of this country. So we at LDF worked with our civil rights partners to immediately issue a statement signed by over 120 organizations to demonstrate the widespread opposition to this executive order. We also filed a federal lawsuit, and we challenged the order on the grounds that it violated the guarantees of free speech, equal protection and due process. And our colleagues at the Lambda Legal Defense Fund followed suit and they secured a nationwide injunction against the enforcement of the order in the Northern District of California. But the most powerful aspect of Executive Order 13950 now revoked, also known as the Trump Truth Ban and, and Equity Gag Order, is that in its aftermath, it unleashed a rash of copycat bills in states across the country. As this next slide shows, in this year alone, in 2021, 29 states have introduced copycat legislation that seeks to erase the truth of what students in public schools in the United States can learn 
and the content they can access about our history. In 14 states, as the next slide shows, various versions of these laws have passed. And some forbid specific materials like the New York Times 1619 project by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Nicole Hannah Jones, who's also a client of the Legal Defense Fund and other specific texts as this next slide shows. Uh, others forbid materials in, in very vague terms. And you can take a moment to look at the terminology on uh, that extracted from some of the state laws and state bills that are pending uh, that forbid materials that make people quote, feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or psychological distress. We are limiting free speech because of how it may make people feel. At bottom, each and every one of these laws legislates ignorance. And each and every one of these laws is anathema to freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. These laws squarely implicate the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause, other federal laws, and many state and local laws across the country. But what's the potential practical impact of these laws on racial justice advocacy? How might they affect your ability to be an effective racial justice advocate? And so to appreciate, and we can end the slide here, to appreciate the impact of this censorship on some of the canonical legal cases in our civil rights and constitutional law jurisprudence, including some that are lesser known, and, and the legal principles that they represent that are core to our multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, I wanna track the stories underlying three transformational constitutional law cases around race and identity. And the echoes of those narratives in the racial justice work that LDF is doing today. Racial justice work that relies on the recognition of these historical truths and their present day impact. So let's start with LDF's 1954 landmark Supreme Court victory, Brown versus Board of Education, conceptualized by our founder, Thurgood Marshall, along with other legal luminaries that you may have heard of, Constance Baker Motley, George Hayes, James Nabritt, Robert Carter. Brown, for those who may not know, brought an eventual end to state-sponsored segregation in public schools through five consolidated cases involving black families from Delaware, Washington DC, Virginia, South Carolina, and most famously, Kansas. Families who put their lives and livelihoods on the line in pursuit of justice and equality. In securing that win from the Warren court, LDF told the story of the devastating impact of the ongoing subjugation of black persons in this country and the detrimental effect of segregation on the psychological well-being of both black and white children. Something that is often omitted from the teachings about our ignominious history of segregation and Jim Crow. The findings concerning the effects of segregation on black children were derived from the clinical trials of two Black Columbia University psychologists, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, who designed and conducted a series of experiments colloquially known as the doll test. And you may have heard of this experiment. The Clarks presented Black children, ranging from four to seven years of age, with four dolls, identical except for color and asked the children to identify the race of the dolls and the color doll they preferred. As shown in this slide, unsurprisingly, but quite painfully, these children who lived under forcibly segregated conditions in which all goods and services to which they were permitted access were generally significantly inferior to those of whites had been inculcated with a view of white supremacy. They not only chose the white doll, but they assigned positive characteristics to it and often negative characteristics to the black dolls 
that resembled themselves. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. referred to this as the false sense of superiority of the segregators and the false sense of inferiority of the segregated. End slide. The negative effects of that false sense of superiority embedded in white supremacy is woefully underexamined. But even with the omission of the effects of segregation on segregationists, we would not have abandoned what was effectively a form of legal apartheid in the United States if those painful stories about black children, those shameful facts, that sordid history were not taught and told, even though they undoubtedly produced feelings of discomfort, distress, and even guilt. In 1954, the same year Brown was decided, the Supreme Court decided another important but lesser known case. Hernandez versus Texas. The claims in Hernandez rose out of facts in Jackson County, Texas, but the story of racial discrimination and jury selection that was at the center of that controversy, in this case, discrimination against Mexican Americans, was a universal one. It was universal in most counties across the country and alarmingly remains an entrenched problem in our criminal legal system. Peter Hernandez, who is shown in this slide, was indicted and convicted by all white juries in a county in which no Mexican American had served on a jury in over 25 years, despite Mexican Americans comprising nearly 14% of the county's population. In nearby Fort Bend County, Texas, the track record was even worse. Despite Mexican Americans comprising 25% of the population, none had served on a jury for 35 years. This systematic exclusion of Mexican Americans reflected the expansive apparatus of Jim Crow that extended in varying degrees to any group deemed to be non-white. The segregated courthouse bathrooms in which Latinx lawyers were forced to, to use during their work directed by the words hombres aquí, under the sign on the bathroom door marked for colored men, black men, the segregated schools in Texas and other overt distinctions and indignities allowed the court to recognize the private and public subordination at play. And, and so building on a series of pre-Brown victories that outlawed segregation in higher ed, including at the University of Texas, a band of local Mexican-American attorneys litigated this important jury discrimination claim before the Supreme Court. And they secured a holding that Texas's exclusion of its Mexican-American residents from juries was an unequivocal violation of the Equal Protection Clause and a badge of group subjugation. Now the court went to great pains to avoid framing this squarely as a race discrimination case as the whiteness of Mexican Americans continued to be debated, but it is inextricably linked to the canon of race cases that have profound resonance today. The final historical case that I'll reference is United States versus Wong King Kim Ark, decided in 1898. Mr. Ark's story centers on what it means to be an American and the contours of birthright citizenship. In 1873, Mr. Ark was born in the United States to Chinese immigrants, Wang Si Ping and Wee Li. They were domiciled in the US, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco to be exact. And his parents came to the US fleeing poverty in China and seeking economic opportunity in the United States. When Mr. Ark was 21 years old, he was returning from a trip to visit his parents who had repatriated to China following a wave of discrimination and attacks against the influx of Chinese migrants that was disparagingly called the Chinese invasion. And Mr. Ark was denied re-entry at US Customs under the theory that the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which prohibited citizenship to Chinese laborers, also excluded their children from citizenship, even if they were born in the US. So Mr. Ark was initially detained 
on the very steamship on which he had attempted to return to the US. And eventually he was transferred to one of the detention centers for immigrants on California's Angel Island. Detainees described their confinement as iron cages or Chinese jails on a devil island to reflect the deplorable conditions in which they were kept. 